go there in his presence. But our task as worshipers of the God of heaven is to learn as much of him as we can through the revelation that he's given us. That's really our task. Learn as much about God as we can through the revelation which, we has given, which he has given to us. And so this series on the attributes of God is just dipping our toes a little bit uh, into that revelation to learn what we know about him. And really, that's a lifelong task of every believer. And so the moment that you became a believer, you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, from that moment you became a worshiper of him, which means you want to be an intelligent worshiper of him, and so you delve into the word and you learn as much about him as you can. You learn about his character, you learn about his promises, you learn about what he has done for you, you learn about what is acceptable worship, and your life is changed in response to what you learn. So that's our task. And this series is just a, a little attempt to, to, to know a little bit more about him. Because although he is incomprehensible, we can never fully grasp everything about him, he is knowable. And as we learned this morning in the equip class, God desires relationship. He doesn't need relationship, but he desires relationship because out of love, he wants us to experience him. That's for our sake, not his sake. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need creation. But because God is love, the Bible says, that love pours and overflows outwardly, and love by nature seeks to include others in that love. And so, you know that. You know that loving person who just seems to, just collects people that he or she can love, and, and a loving person <coughs> overflows. God is love. And so that love overflows, and he seeks to share his love with others. He doesn't need to. He does it for our benefit. And so God, we have learned, is love. He is knowable, which means he, he invites us to relationship with him. Remember, we learned about his love looking at the parable of the prodigal son. We learned that God exists in a trinity, that that love is expressed within the, 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 the triune relationship between God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We also learned that God is holy. And I don't know if you remember this, but we learned that God is, uh, there's two aspects of holiness, and that is his majestic holiness and his ethical holiness. Remember, that majestic holiness is the fact that God is wholly separate from all of creation. There is nothing like God and nothing to which God can be compared. And so we, we must be willing to embrace this idea that God is wholly other than anything. There's no category into which we can cram God. There's nothing in our experience to which we can uh, compare him in order to understand him. So we accept that he's wholly other and incomprehensible. Um, we also, though in that, understand that there is with his majestic holiness an ethical holiness. And the ethical holiness of God becomes very, very practical for us. Because the ethical holiness of God shows us that he is entirely separate from sin. But even that is not a really accurate way to describe the ethical holiness of God. The ethical holiness of God is to say, all that God is determines the standard of what is sin and what is not sin. What God is, is holiness and righteousness. Anything that God is not, then, is what we deem to be sin. Anything that violates God's character or opposes God's character is sin. So God's very nature and his character determines what sin is. God does not answer to any standard outside of himself. So it's not really accurate to say, well, well God uh, can never sin. Well, that's true, but that's axiomatic. He cannot sin because all that he is, is not sin, uh, if that makes any sense. So, we learn that God is holy. There's a majestic holiness, there's an ethical holiness. Where this becomes incredibly practical is that God's ethical holiness governs the entire world. So God's standard of what is right and wrong, according to his character, governs the entire universe. It governs his entire creation. So God creates, and all of God's creation must abide by his ethical holiness. So God demands. It's just, the, it's just the, the, the order of the universe. All things made by God are under his authority and his lordship, and therefore all things made by God must abide 
by his standard of ethical holiness. And so, it would receive the Ten Commandments. And we don't murder, and we don't commit adultery, and we don't lie, and we don't steal, and so on. You go through those Ten Commandments. Uh, those are just simply God's ethical holiness put into words. It's just the codification of God's holy character. That's what the law is. And so he grants us, and he says, okay, by creation, this is who I am. This is what I am like, and this is what I demand of you. And so he puts it in the law. And we can read that. And it's just a glimpse of who God is and what he demands of us if we are to live in accord with his ethical holiness. Now, we got to add something else in here. God is holy, majestic, holiness, ethical holiness, which governs his creation. God also, because he is authority and judge and Lord, God is, I guess you could say, the enforcer of his ethical holiness. And that is, all that complies with his ethical holiness is to be commended by God. But all which opposes God's ethical holiness is to be judged by God. God is also God of justice. And so God will uphold the law of his ethical holiness, which is to govern the universe. So everywhere something violates God's standard of right and wrong according to his holy character, that thing will be judged. It's the nature of God. He is as just as he is loving. And so every wrong will be righted. Every violation of his holy character will be judged. And so our responsibility as those who worship the God of the Bible is to accept his justice just as readily as we accept his love. And so it's a very popular to say, God is love. And we define that love however we want. Generally, we define love as he accepts you as you are. And uh, whatever makes you happy is what makes him happy. And that's how we define love. It's our responsibility to accept the God that we worship according to his own revelation. And so we must be willing to accept his love. And we must also be willing to accept his justice. And he is to be worshipped and praised and glorified as much for his love as he is to be worshipped and praised and glorified for his justice. And so God will judge. He loves, yes. He's merciful, yes. He's gracious, yes. He's also righteous and he's just. And that justice will be expressed by what the Bible calls the wrath of that's what we're going to look at this morning. It's not a pleasant, hey, I'm going to put it right up. This is not a pleasant sermon. You're not going to leave this place kicking your heels, thinking about how great of a person you are. Okay, that's not my goal. That's not, uh, that's not the purpose of studying a topic like this. This is to elevate God and for us to understand who it is that rules this universe and who rules over us. God will right every wrong. He will judge every injustice. He will... Um, satisfy his standard of righteousness against all that violates his holy character. And he will do so in what the Bible calls his wrath. What is the wrath of God? Well, the Bible uses multiple words for the wrath of God. I'll just give you, I'm going to get into the Greek word, but we'll just talk over in Hebrew word, we'll just talk about some of the definitions. So the word is used to bring about this idea of something that is heated up, burning, with fury. Numbers 25 verse 3 says, So Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. They're worshiping idols, and, and kindled is that fire that begins, that, that is inflamed against Israel. Uh, that speaks of his wrath. There's also the idea of bitterness. Fierce and bitter anger against ungodliness and against ungodly nations. Zechariah 1.15 says, And I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. He's saying, uh, I'm wrathful towards these ungodly nations. It brings the idea of venom or, or poison or something that's fatal or lethal. The word wrath is used synonymously with fury. It even brings with it the idea of the flaring of the nostrils. You think about, about a bull who's angry and ready to attack. And, and the face is inflamed, the, the nostrils are, are, are flaring in anger. It brings with it that idea as well. There's an intense anger here that's ready to be unleashed. Now, this ought to instill in us some fear. 
The God who loves us in a way which is greater than, than any man could ever express. The God who loves us and who has expressed us the greatest, greatest expression of love that could ever be expressed. The greatest expression of self-sacrificial love. The sending of the Lord Jesus Christ. That God who loves us. that we read about Romans 8 today. The God who gives us such a love which no man can ever separate us from. That God of love is also a God of vehement, furious wrath. This is a wrath which reaches a fever pitch, but it's important to realize that we don't understand God's wrath by comparing it to man's wrath. Man's wrath, when we think about a wrathful man, we think about a man who is who's lost control of himself. We think about a man who's, who's going on some tirade or some rampage and he's lost control. This is not God. God's wrath is cool, it is calculated, it is doled out in perfect measure according to his standard of justice. And that is all who are on the receiving end of his wrath receive exactly and only exactly what their sin deserves. That's an important thing to realize. There are categories of God's wrath. And we're just going to kind of hit some of these categories. It'll be a little bit of a, almost a theology lesson uh, here this morning, but uh, I think we get seven of them uh, to kind of understand God's wrath. First of all, we understand that there is the wrath of what I've written, the wrath of natural consequences, or consequential wrath. And what this is, is because God is the Lord, and because He is the Creator, He's the authority. It means that all of His creation operates according to the laws which He has designed. Right? So we, we talk about the, uh, uh, the laws of nature, the laws of science. Well, these are really just God's laws. All things happen according to the way that God designed. And so science is just a matter of, of mankind studying and concluding and figuring out and uh, uh, observing how God is doing all that He's done and how things operate according to His laws. And so you go on top of a building and you jump off. Well, there's a law at work there. The law is you're going to fall. Uh, you know, there's, there's a thing called gravity. God designed it. And so you know there's cause and effect. You, you jump from a high uh, point, you're going to fall, and you're probably going to die. Uh, that's God's law, uh, gravitational law. Okay, God designed that. Man has discovered it. Man has named it. But that's just the way that God made things work. But do you realize that that also exists in the moral and spiritual realm as well? And so, God has designed us morally in such a way that when we operate according to his moral design, there are certain results, beneficial results, results that are a blessing. When we violate God's moral design for mankind, there are natural consequences for that. God does not have to bust into our lives and miraculously judge us when we violate his moral law. Because this is simply the law by which all of us are governed as human beings. And so when you violate God's design, okay, uh, you're a married man, you decide you're going to have an affair. There are some consequences that are going to happen. You personally are going to be living a life where you're overcome with guilt. Uh, you're going to be uh, living a life where you're overcome with anxiety. Um, your marriage relationship is going to be destroyed. You're going to be living in misery there. Uh, children that are in your home are going to sense that. And uh, they are going to be emotionally harmed as a result of that as well. Uh, they then, having grown up in a home like this, with a broken home, with a father who's been unfaithful to the mother, and seeing the conflict there in the home, they're going to grow up, and they are going to have some things to overcome uh, when they get married. And if they don't realize that, they're going to pass that on to the next generation because they have not had a good and a culture then that violates God's design when it comes to morality, or when it comes to family, when it comes to marriage, uh, there's generational consequences for that. And you can see it across the culture. We see that today. Well, oh, what has happened? Does God have to come down and miraculously judge a culture that's violated his designs for family and for marriage and relationship? No. There's built-in consequences. And so you have delinquent children, and you have marriages that don't last, and so on. And you have misery, and heartache, and, and depression, and, and all this that, that floods in when we violate his design. Uh, that's just built in wrath. That's God saying, if you want sin, and you want to violate my character, there are consequences. And 
so you have sexually transmitted diseases and you have familial consequences and uh, these things are just a natural outgrowth of violating God's design. We could call it consequential wrath. The, the, the wrath of natural consequences. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. There it is. If you sow a violation of God's design, you will reap his wrath. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. So, there is a consequential wrath that is brought on by the flagrant disobedience by an individual or a culture or a society or by a nation. There is also what we could call a, a catastrophic wrath. There is consequential wrath which is simply built into the natural order of things. And so we need to learn that as a culture. There, there are, however, also times and generally this is when a culture continues on experiencing the consequential wrath of God but continuing and continuing and continuing thinking. Why is a society never smart enough to say? I mean, I mean, from a governmental level, why is it that no culture ever? There's no, never a president or a prime minister or a politician who's saying, "You know what, nation? If you see where our youth are today, and you see our our levels of violence, and you see uh, the the murders and uh, the rapes and, and and so on, you know, we're not going in a good direction. So maybe we need to try something different morally. That's never the solution." The solution is we need more money uh, to, to put this program into place, or, or we just need more education, or we just need to find ways. Uh, we just need to tell our kids to have safe sex while they're out there uh, fornicating before marriage, or whatever it is. Uh, the, the solution is never, maybe we need to consider what we're doing morally, because when we violate uh, the standard of morality, there seems to be some lasting consequences. No. Man is so rebellious that he will bear the brunt of God's consequential wrath and continue down that road until the entire culture is plunged into or under the consequences. And God sees that. And there are times where it is necessary where God steps in and he brings forth a catastrophic wrath. When he looks at a culture and says, it is entirely corrupt. It is entirely corrupt. In fact, as God holds in reserve a full and final judgment to the end of eternity, yet there are times in human history where he pours out a catastrophic wrath upon societies and cultures, nations. So, again, if you've been following the lottery schedule, which I'm very encouraged by all those who are doing the lottery schedule, especially among our young people, very encouraging. You've been in Genesis 6, you've been in Genesis 18. In Genesis 18, not too long ago, Genesis 6, what does it say? Verse 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of man. God saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. This is God's catastrophic wrath. He sees mankind. Yeah, they were suffering, naturally. You suffer the consequential wrath of your decisions. So, that, so they were already experiencing the natural consequences for their sin. But it was so corrupt. Every thought of the heart was only evil continually that God said, I'm going to wipe them out. And he did so. Saving Noah and his family alive. Fast forward to Genesis 18. On a smaller scale. Verse 20, it says, The Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, and if not, I will know. And then God sends two angels. He sends angels to Sodom to go rescue Lot, who apparently in the New Testament describes him as a righteous man, but uh, not at that time in his life. So the angels come to rescue Lot and his family, these men come into the city. The city had was so given over to sexual perversion. They had so turned God's design for sexuality on its head that when these men came into the city to rescue Lot, all, it says, all, the, all the men in the city, from the oldest 
to the young, surround this home and say, these men who came in, send them out. Because they wanted to rape them. That's how perverse that society had become. And so, God hears the cry of the immorality. It's a stench on the earth. And just as the Bible speaks of incense rising to the nostrils of God, just as he speaks of our prayers rising to his nostrils like incense that he brings in and delights in, so there's a stench on the earth when man violates his designs, when man turns on his head God's design for sexuality. This comes to the ears of God and to the nostrils of God, and he responds to that stench with judgment. And so he sends these angels and says, go to Sodom and see if it's as bad as it sounds. Now, this is all an exercise. This is all a formality for the sake of man, so that Abraham could experience this, and so Lot could experience this. God knew everything was happening. He sends these angels in to rescue Lot. Lot is a wicked man. He's a wicked man. And if you read the story, you heard what Lot's solution was to these men wanting to come and his solution was as wicked as what these men wanted to do. In Genesis 19, verse 12, then the men said to Lot, have, it, have you anyone else here? Sons of laws, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against his people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. And he does destroy it. And fire rains from heaven. I know God providentially uh, ordered a meteor shower or volcanic, or volcanic eruption, whatever it was, but he wipes out these two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. That's his catastrophic wrath. In Egypt, we saw this morning in the equip class, Moses is seeking to lead the people out, and Pharaoh says, no, God with a mighty hand sends plagues on Egypt on a grand scale. That's his catastrophic wrath. Sometimes he does that in our world today with droughts and famines and other severe judgments for those who reject his design. There's a catastrophic wrath, and there's a consequential wrath. Next of all, there's also what they call an abiding wrath. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. For it, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. He's saying the gospel is for Jews and Greeks. For everybody. The gospel, the good news of salvation, is for everybody. Why? Because verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. He's saying there is a reality that says all men born into this world it has been revealed, are subject to the wrath of God because of their very nature. Now, up to this point, you say, consequential wrath. Well, I'm going to just try not to violate God's design, and then I won't be subject to his wrath. Catastrophic wrath. You say, well, I'm not going to go to the depths of my own depravity uh, in a culture that's doing the same, so therefore I, won't not, I will not be subject to his catastrophic wrath. Well, number three, when we begin to think of his abiding wrath, there is no escape from his abiding wrath for those who do not believe. And so the Bible teaches that there is a wrath of God which has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, and that is every man and woman born into this world has the wrath of God hanging over their heads, being held back only by his long-suffering mercy. This is the natural state in which mankind finds himself. Everyone born into the world is a sinner, and every sinner living in violation of God's ethical holiness is subject to his justice, which is executed by the pouring out of his wrath. So Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3 says, Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by children, or I'm sorry, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. We, we are born that way. Children of wrath. All of mankind. And so, man naturally finds himself opposed to God, living as his enemy, 
and naturally then subject to his wrath, that abiding wrath. Every day that a sinner lives his life separated from God, he's living it opposed to God, and he's living it subject to his wrath. And every day that a sinner lives apart from God, opposed to God, subject to his wrath, he is storing up more wrath upon more wrath upon more wrath, until that day when all of that wrath will be poured out upon him. Romans chapter 2 verse 5 says, But because of your hard and impenitent heart, if you don't know what impenitent means, it means you're, you will not repent. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. On the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Now, there's grace here in this passage, isn't there? Because he makes a division. For these there will be eternal life and for these there will be wrath. And so we see that we get a glimpse there is an escape here, isn't there? But the fact is, many have likened this idea of wrath and judgment to the, the picture of a dam holding back a rushing river. That dam is God's long-suffering mercy, and that rushing, powerful river is his wrath. In every day of the life of an unbeliever, that river becomes a little stronger, a little bit heavier against that dam. And the day is coming where God's long-suffering mercy will let go. And that wrath will come pouring down upon the unbeliever. And so some would look and say, well, everything has continued as it's continued from the beginning. Thousands of years people have been talking about God as a God of judgment and God's going to come and he's going to wipe out unbelievers and nothing's happened. Everything's continued today as it has for millennia. And many will use that as an excuse to not believe. We cannot be fooled by God's delay. God's delay is a delay of mercy. So 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, then the heavens will pass away with a roar, the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved in the earth, and the works that are done in it, on it will be exposed. Again, God's wrath is there, but God's mercy is there as well. God's patient towards you. Why? Because he wants you to come to salvation so that none would perish, but all reach repentance so that you can escape that wrath. But then Peter gives the assurance. The day is coming, like a thief, is going to be serious and is going to be severe and there will be no escape in that day. The heavens will pass away the roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. There's no turning back at that point. There's no second chance at that point. He is not, he's holding back his wrath now by his dam of mercy so that now in this life, in this moment, many can come to repentance. God's mercy extended does not mean his wrath withdrawn. His mercy extended does not mean his wrath withdrawn. It simply means his wrath is delayed. And that's for our sake. The fact is, God is angry with the sinner. Psalm 5, 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. And when I read these things, I can't help but immediately want to balance it out. I'm reading this, I'm thinking, okay, but the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but, but God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so there's the balance. He is angry with sinners. He hates all evildoers. He'll destroy those who speak lies. And yet God is so loving that while his wrath is kindled against these, his love and his compassion is also moved towards these. And so he desires that the evildoer turn from his evil. 
that the liar turn from his lying, that the boastful turn from his boasting, that the bloodthirsty turn from their bloodthirstiness and repent so that they can be delivered from his wrath. Psalm 711 says, God is a righteous judge and a God who feels indignation every day. There is no break to God's wrath, just as there is no break to God's love. There's no break in God's justice, just as there is no break in God's grace. God is preparing to judge the sinner, and he is now ready to judge the sinner. And so Psalm chapter 2, verse 12 says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled, lest are all who take refuge in him. I want you to look at that verse for a minute. This is an Old Testament prophecy looking forward to Christ. He's the son. Kiss the Son. Bow before the Son. Reconcile with the Son. Why? Because it is the Son to whom God has delegated the exercise of all of His wrath. And we're going to see that in Revelation in a minute. So you must reconcile with the Son. You must come to Him, says, kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. But then it says this, Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Think about this. The one, and this is a threat, by the way, the, the one who issues the threat, the one who will execute the wrath, is the very same one who offers us refuge. And so we come to God and say, God, because I fear you, and because... I do fear your wrath, and I need escape from your wrath. I come to take refuge in you. And then you see all this biblical imagery of God like a, like a hen with, with his wings coming to gather together his children to protect. You have the imagery of a shepherd who, who picks up a lamb in his arms and cradles that lamb. The same God who issues the warning of his wrath is a God who will take you up in his arms and offer refuge from that same wrath. And so his wrath does not make us run from him, but his wrath makes us run to him. And kiss the Son. Embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. And say, I must escape the wrath of God. And the only way to do it is through Christ, and so I run to him. This is a serious matter. The wrath of God is already abiding over the heads of of every sinner. But there is an escape. Now, there is, we've touched on the fact that God's wrath comes with it, an invitation to escape his wrath. There is a way to escape his wrath. But there are those who are so resolute in the rejection of God, so resolute in their determination that they will not obey him, uh, that God at times must exercise another aspect of his wrath, which we could call his abandonment wrath. This he expressed uh, to Ephraim in Hosea 4.17. It says, if Ephraim is joined to idols, leave him alone. If Ephraim is joined to idols, leave him alone. The greatest act of judgment that God could ever execute upon mankind is simply to leave him alone. Why? Because our natural bent is rebellion. Our natural bent is sin. And so, what is the likely consequence of that natural bent is a life of misery, a life of despair, a, a, a life of mental turmoil and emotional turmoil. Because those are the natural consequences of sin. And so the worst judgment in this life that God can really pronounce upon man is just to let him go. And what you don't realize this morning, some of you don't realize it, is that God has a restraining hand in your life. And so you've heard the phrase before, you see somebody uh, just commit some atrocious sin or something, and you hear other believers say, oh, but by the grace of God, they have a lot. That's absolutely true. What he's saying is that I know that God's grace is a restraining hand in my life that keeps me from going and pursuing the depths of my own depravity. 
That's a healthy fear. Understanding that God can remove that restraining hand and allow one to just go unrestrained pursuing sin and unrighteousness. That's his abandonment wrath. See Proverbs chapter 1 verse 24. It says, because I have called and you refuse to listen. Have stretched out my hand and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they have hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despise all of my reproof, Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. Primary context here is talking about wisdom, but the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord, so these things are connected. Because they have hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, God's saying, when you reject divine wisdom, when you reject the fear of the Lord, and you do it resolutely as I'm extending grace and extending grace and extending mercy and inviting you to come and to escape my wrath. And you, with, with resoluteness, say, no, it's okay. I give you over. I will abandon you to your own sin, your own devices. God sometimes does this to individuals. But God also at times does this for entire cultures. God at times does this for entire nations. Romans chapter 1 verse 19. It says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that he has made. So they are without excuse. He's saying that, listen, creation is enough. Creation is enough. All mankind is culpable and accountable for the rejection of God on the basis of creation alone. The very fact that you exist is enough to say you ought to turn to the one who created you. And so, as our family, we've uh, been enjoying watching Planet Earth, right? Planet Earth 2. Fantastic. I mean, you gotta look past the fact that David Attenborough wants to always make his cousins among monkeys and stuff like this. But but you but you watch God's creation. We were watching the other day, and I think it was in Brazil, and uh, uh, there's a kind of like a jungle type atmosphere there, and, and, and the the forest floor is covered in I think it's 36 feet or something, very deep water there. Um, and very few men have been able to go in there and to explore. And this is you know rivers. This is a this is, I mean, this is very, very far from the ocean. And uh, we're watching this, and David Attenborough's narrating. Um, and he talks about a creature there that's, that's rarely ever been observed, and they had to go to great lengths to try to find it. And they finally were able to. They had a drone, and it was over the water, and they were able to capture a glimpse of the river dolphin. And at that moment, Silas looked at me, and I looked at Silas, and we're like, river dolphin. Seriously, the river dolphin. Never ever, never conceived that you could have a dolphin living in a river, in this murky, muddy water, in the midst of a jungle-like atmosphere, and you've got dolphins there. And the narrator indicated that that area of Brazil has much of it that has never been discovered by mankind yet. And we watch this, and we're in awe, just in absolute awe of God's creation and God's design. It's stunning. And so looking at creation can become a worshipful experience. As you look and you're amazed by it, you give God all the glory for his creation. This is exactly what the unbeliever fails to do. And they justify it in the name of, uh, they, they pit science against God. And they use, in the name of science, reject the idea that God is creator. This is what they've been doing forever. Romans chapter 1 continues. It says, God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, are clearly perceived. How? Creation. So that we are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. 
But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up. There's his abandonment. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And by the way, receiving in themselves the due penalty of their error, that's consequential error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Hey, if you say, I, I can't connect with that, you can connect with this, because this is our culture right now. You say, God's wrath is coming, God's judgment is, God's wrath and God's judgment is already at work. Man's rejection of God, our culture's rejection of God has invited this abandonment wrath. And so he has given much of our culture up to this exercise of these sensual sins, completely turning on his head God's design for mankind. And part of that abandonment is allowing these to reap the natural consequences of the sin that they've given themselves over to. This abandonment is exactly what it seems to imply. This one chooses to become their own God, and God says, okay, I give you over to that. There's no way back to God. When man becomes absolutely resolute in the rejection of his offer of salvation. So, we move on from his abandonment wrath to what we could call his, don't be afraid of this word, eschatological wrath. What do we mean by this? This just means the wrath that he's going to exercise in the end, in the end times. That is, human nature is coming to a climax. God does have a set amount of time for humans on earth in this world. We don't know what it is. No man knows. But we do know this. Mankind's time on earth will end in a flurry of God's wrath being poured out upon this world. In that day, you can be assured, global warming is going to happen. God is going to burn up this world with the, the human's heat, he's going to do that. He's probably going to use natural processes to see it happen, because that's often how he operates. But there will be a eschatological wrath. This is a grand climax to human nature. Uh, in, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, you see this. This is Jesus Christ in his exalted state in heaven, who's handed a scroll. This scroll is a title deed to the universe. It's saying, Christ through redemption has bought all of creation for himself. He is now Lord over all that he has redeemed. And so he's handed the title deed of the universe. And he begins to open this seal, taking ownership for himself as the Lord of creation. And each time he opens one of these seals, a new judgment is poured out upon the earth. <clears throat> the interesting thing about this is that the grand climax of Jesus Christ receiving to himself the creation that he has redeemed is also the grand climax of wrath and judgment being poured out upon the earth. Revelation 6, 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, 
fallen us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. Who can stand? The grand climax of all that God is doing on this earth as far as human, human's role in this earth is concerned is a day of wrath. The wrath of the Lamb. He's called the Lamb because on one hand he's the Lamb who sacrificed himself out of love for all who believe. On the other hand, that very same Lamb will be the one responsible for pouring out wrath upon those who have rejected him. In Revelation chapter 19, heaven rejoices that finally the wrath of God is being poured out upon the earth. Why would heaven rejoice? Because there is a grand injustice. That continues as long as God withholds his wrath. Do you get that? There's a grand injustice that continues while God withholds his wrath. But he won't withhold it forever. God will be perfectly satisfied in every one of his attributes. And so his standard of righteousness will be upheld. His standard of righteousness and justice will be upheld. And all of his wrath will be satisfied. And God's people will not rest and will not be satisfied until God is finally and fully vindicated where his justice and his wrath are concerned. And that's what we see here with this cry. Well, we need to move on for the sake of time. There is also his eternal wrath. There is an eternal torment. Revelation 20, 14. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That's the eternal wrath. And again, you see the division made. There are those who escape that, those who are written in the book of life. And then lastly, we come to God's redemptive wrath. Uh, redemptive wrath. When Noah's family, when God poured out the flood upon the earth, you know, why about all mankind? If there was a man named Noah, and God said that he uh, was righteous in the, God, in the eyes of God. And God spared Noah. He provided an ark. He spared Noah and his family. Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire rains down from heaven and destroys these cities. Yet Lot and his family are saved alive. The plagues of Egypt. God pours a plague after plague, and yet he protects that little that area called Goshen where the Israelites are. The death angel comes and the death of the firstborn happens in Egypt and God spares all those who partake of the Passover putting the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. You just said something? I didn't hear what it was. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty well sums up OC this morning, doesn't it? <laughs> Great way to end the sermon. He said something, we didn't get it. Um, God's eschatological wrath also the wrath he pours out in the end times. He seals 144,000 that will not suffer that wrath. Every time God pours out his wrath, he makes it very clear there is a way to escape his wrath. And so, that also applies to us in that, I'll say this, the, the greatest picture of this, God's wrath being poured out while his love and his mercy are also on display, so you see that water covering the earth, God's wrath upon all mankind. You, you see that ark, and you see his love and his mercy and his grace. Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed, but you see Lot being pulled out by his, by his hand by an angel. You see God's love and his mercy and his grace on display. Plagues of Egypt. You see the protection of Israel. You see God's love and grace and mercy on display while his wrath is being poured out. On the cross, God's wrath is being poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet in that moment, Christ was on the cross as an act of God's love. The fact that he was bearing the wrath of God for us was an act of his mercy, and his love, and his grace. Matthew 27, verse 45. It says, Now from the sixth hour, this is Christ upon the cross, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, let us back tonight. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
What is this? God's redemptive wrath. God pours out his wrath against sinners, but he pours it out upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Christ shoulders the wrath of God upon the cross. And during that time, it says there was darkness, there were earthquakes. God the Father turns his hatred of sin towards his Son. The one with whom God has perfect eternal love. Within that trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. God takes his hatred and his indignation and his furious wrath, and he pours it upon his Son, and his Son becomes anathema to him. His Son becomes the cursed one. But in all of that, you see the severity of his wrath, but in all of that, it was an act of love. An act of love towards us. Wrath will be poured out upon sin, but God provides a way to escape. So John 3.36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You know what that verse sounds like to me? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like kiss the Son, lest his anger be. Believe in him, have eternal life, and if not, the wrath of God remains on you. There is a way to escape, but if we do not take that way to es uh, of escape, there's a guarantee, and the guarantee is the wrath of God remains on you. Either you take the wrath of God being poured out upon Christ, and have that counted on your behalf by believing in him, by submitting yourself to him, or God's wrath remains on you. And the day's going to come where you're going to bear the full brunt of that wrath, when he releases, removes his hand of mercy, when the dam breaks, you will receive the full brunt of his wrath. And that you believe in the Son. So this is God's love. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Romans 5, 9 says, Therefore, we have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Is it, is it right to say you're saved from your sin? Yeah. Is it right to say you're saved from hell? Yeah. It's a little bit more accurate to say you are saved from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 says, We are to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Romans 3.25 says, thinking of Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. This is what he's saying in conclusion. Jesus is the one, propitiation, he is the one who bore the wrath. He's the one who satisfied the wrath of God. This was to show that God was holding back his judgment. How is it that he could have people all throughout the Old Testament whom he embraced in a relationship before Christ? Before salvation had been accomplished. He was withholding that until the day of Christ. And so Christ becomes the one who receives the wrath, who assuages the wrath of God, which was to show that God's wrath, though delayed, was not withdrawn, he poured it out upon the Lord Jesus Christ so that he could be just. That is, his holy standard will be satisfied. He will be just. He's not overlooking any sin. But then he can also be the justifier of those who believe in Christ. You can understand this. He can be the justifier of those who are sinners who deserve his wrath while also maintaining his justice. He doesn't overlook sin. He doesn't excuse it. Through the cross, he is able to not only justify the sinner, but he's also able to be just in fulfilling his righteous standard of justice. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word, and Lord, we do praise you for your, all of your attributes. We thank you for your love and your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for your compassion. Thank your goodness towards us.